Well, I would invite you to take your Bibles and open them to Galatians chapter 1 as I continue my series in Galatians. Oh, wait. I don't have a series in Galatians. Turn there anyway. Mike gave me permission as long as I didn't go to Ruth. And who knows why I would go to Ruth to preach whatever I wanted. So here we are in Galatians uh, chapter 1 this morning. I think we got a real lesson this week in tolerance, how it works, how it doesn't work, what it means, what it doesn't mean. As far as words go, I think tolerance has been stretched, folded, spindled, mutilated. I mean, it, it virtually has lost all of its previous meaning. It's become a buzzword, and basically it means that for you to be tolerant means you must accept any sinful activity that anybody wants to participate in. If you don't, you are intolerant. And guess what? Intolerance could uh, potentially cost you your job for a few days and then they hire you back. But if you haven't been watching the news, somebody did lose their job this week for saying some things crassly about homosexual uh, behavior. And uh, it was all over the news, so I don't know what you guys are watching. But anyway, today there, are, there, there is a group that a lot of people agree deserve condemnation. Who is that group? What's those people that actually hold to a standard that says there is objective truth? In fact, there are some really bad people, and those people sometimes are referred to as heretic hunters. They like to think of themselves as discernment ministries. Here's what they do. They listen to what people teach from the Bible and they say, does that match up with what the Bible says? Now, to some people, that's horrible, especially to false teachers, right? They don't like that. They don't like being called out. But we're going to see in our passage this morning that we need to be discerning. We need to examine things that are taught. We need to look at what the Bible says. We need to be able to distinguish between truth and error. Now, the Church of Galatia is part of what today would be called Turkey. Some of you may be familiar with the term Asia Minor. It's that little peninsula that gets really close to Greece doesn't quite get there, adjacent to modern-day Bulgaria. I mean, how many, you know, it's in the Mediterranean. It's between the Mediterranean and the Black Seas. I could go on, but I won't. It would be pointless. That's where it is. That's where the church was, actually a group of churches. But it's unusual. This book is unusual among all the books. Why? Because typically Paul gives some kind of warm greeting and then he addresses whatever issue it is that he wants to address with them. Maybe it's multiple issues. But listen to some of the ways he starts his letters. Book of Romans. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. To even the church at Corinth with all their problems. Listen, 1 Corinthians 1, 2 says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. To the church at Ephesus, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, he wrote, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, a tenderness. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he wrote, this is kind of a little plain, but he says, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, at least identifying them as being in Christ, listen to how he starts the book of Galatians, the letter to the church at Galatia. To the churches of Galatia. Stop. No qualifiers, no praise. Just the bare, plain facts. It's as if he's just naming them and giving their address. You're a church, you're at Galatia. This really is not a long-distance hug. It's kind of more like a long-distance slap, if we're being candid. 
We like to be candid. Lightfoot said of this opening, he says, it is an indignant expression of surprise that takes the place of the usual thanksgiving for the faith of his converts. This is the only instance where St. Paul does not express his thankfulness in addressing a church. The only time. And also, as I read, because I'm going to read through the first five verses, we're going to start on uh, Galatians 1. We're going to read 1 through 12, and I'm going to focus on 6 through 12 this morning. But even as I read, I want you to just look at how he focuses on his apostleship, the nature of it. Why? Why was that important? Because he wanted the church to understand, look, I have some authority here. You know, when I responded to calls in Los Angeles County, people look at my uniform and they go, well, there's a representative of the government, of the sheriff. This is a deputy. I need to respect him. And here's what he's doing. He's pulling the authority card right off the bat. I want you guys to know this is just not my opinion. I am writing as an official messenger from the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it so important? Because the church at Galatia had been infiltrated by a movement known as the Judaizers. These were people who wanted to kind of marry the old covenant with the new. You, you could be saved by grace, but you also needed to be circumcised. In fact, it's interesting, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible is in the book of Galatians, where Paul, and the reason I like it is because I'm somewhat irreverent, Paul goes to the man the Catholics call the first pope, Peter, and confronts him for his theological error, right to his face. The theme of this book is justification by faith alone. There's nothing that can be added to it. And you're going to hear me say that a lot today. If you add something to the gospel, you negate the gospel. You can't do it. But that's what these men were doing. They had begun teaching that justification was not a matter of faith alone. In fact, they even said that Paul, you know, when he was in various places, he would actually prescribe circumcision. So how dare he withhold it from the church of Galatia? He just doesn't want you guys to take that extra step that really gets you into heaven. This was an assault on the sufficiency of the death of Christ to justify believers. It's an attack on the gospel. How does one get to heaven? How is one declared righteous by God? The Judaizers had to be dealt with in a most severe manner. This rebellion against the grace of God had to be put down. And Paul was, in effect, the general of the forces that were going to put it down. And I'm speaking, I'm using a lot of militaristic terms. Why? Because this is spiritual warfare. If you pick up some almost, I'll call it science fiction, it's Christian fiction, you know, that, that deals with spiritual warfare. It's about demons and angels and behind the scene warfare. And, you know, this is all going on and we have no clue. Here's spiritual warfare. It's truth versus error. It's the gospel versus non-gospels. Are demons involved? Yes. But not in some physical confrontation with angels. This is a battle of ideas. That's a consistent theme of spiritual warfare. It is about assaults on the gospel. And that's what we're dealing with here today. Let's read our text, Galatians 1, verses 1 to 12. And again, notice his authority and how it's up front and center here. Paul an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. My authority is not man-given, it's God-given. He's writing, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches, the, the fellow Christians who are with him, to the churches of Galatia. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Nice little encapsulation, basically, of the gospel, what has been done. Now look at verse 6. I am astonished 
that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I still, or excuse me, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached, that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this morning I want to draw your attention to three truths drawn from our text so that you will really treasure the gospel. It was and is under attack and it needs to be proclaimed, defended, guarded. And really what we need to do is whenever we hear somebody say, thus saith the Lord, or this is the gospel, we need to compare that with scripture and see if it is so. Our first truth is, and I used a lot of A's, we, we have some mild alliteration going on here. Our first truth is abandoning grace is abandoning Christ. Abandoning grace is abandoning Christ. Look again at verse six. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, the person who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Turning from God, the one who called them in Christ and turning to a different gospel. Listen to what Hendrickson said. He says, what we find here is not satisfaction, as would be typical with other churches, but stupefaction, overwhelming amazement, painful perplexity. Paul is shocked. He is indeed stupefied. Listen, he, he, he's shocked. Can't even believe this. Other churches have their problems, but Paul writes of his thankfulness for the work of God in them, how he's directing them thus far, and then he addresses the issues that maybe they need to change. But Paul is stunned by the theological desertion of the Galatians. They are essentially traitors, turncoats. They've abandoned Christ. Now imagine using such language about other churches today, accusing them essentially of theological treason, What's going to happen? You're going to be called intolerant, a heretic hunter. But what's the truth? The truth is that people who water down grace, who want to add something to the gospel, are leading people to hell. Now, this Greek verb translated deserting pictures a complete changing of affections. It's as if a man seems, married man seems perfectly content and happy with his wife, and the next day he runs off with another woman. It's that radical. It's a complete changing of allegiance. Would that it would be only just a moral failure. And you say, well, only a moral failure? This is much worse. Because it's not just them. It's not just this one particular group. This has an impact at the Church of Galatia, and if it's not stomped out, it will have a broader impact. It marks these people who believe in this as those who are not just merely ensnared in some sin, but those who have been visited by the grace of God, who have tasted and seen that it is good, and then run from it. The Galatians have heard the gospel. They've been taught the gospel. They gave assent to the gospel. They said they believed. Now consider the contrast between this letter and again, just the, the letters written to the church of Corinth with all of its problems. Remember they had problems of unity. They had problems of immorality in their midst. 
They misuse their spiritual gifts. The, the problems are, go on and on and on. In fact, people have just written books about the problems of the church at Corinth. But Paul took time to praise God for them. Why? Because like other Christians, they stumbled, they fell down, but God was at work in them. They weren't perfect, but they were, it's not the direction, it's, or it's not the perfection, it's the direction of their lives. But the church in Galatia doesn't get anything like that. They get a cannon blast, a full fusillade, as it were, right in the face. Paul doesn't hold anything back. Why? Because there's nothing more serious. There is no greater failing than abandoning the gospel of Christ. There was a fleeing from God. It says desertion. They they ran away. Our text tells us that they were quickly deserting. It was like a stampede. They were not thinking through. They had like a herd mentality. They were not thinking through what they were being told. They were not comparing this different gospel to the Bible. They were not carefully scrutinizing the teaching to see if it matched the scripture as the Bereans were committed for. They heard about this new gospel, this new and improved gospel, this new edition of the Bible or uh, of the gospel. And they couldn't wait. They had been called to grace. They had been called to believe in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in him alone. But they were switching allegiance from that gospel to a different gospel. Now, how is it different? Well, it really, the word means, and it's the word from which we get hetero, it really means of a a different type. Um, I mean, you know, a couple of examples. It's like I asked my wife to go to the store and get me. Now, she didn't she wouldn't fail like this. I ask her to go get my favorite Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And she comes back with store brand ice milk. Or worse yet, some kind of sugar free frozen yogurt or something, you know, like, come on. We're not we're not even in the same ballpark. When we say hetero, we understand that they are opposites, especially in this day and age when we're told that hetero doesn't matter anymore. You know, homo is just fine. A man and a woman, they're opposite. Opposites attract. We understand that. And that's the word that's used here. This is an opposite of the gospel. This is no gospel at all. This is like going from the gospel of grace to this new, improved, additional gospel Gospel plus, let's just call it. It's like going from the United States to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. For you kids, that's really bad. How did this happen? Well, the Galatians have been beguiled by smooth talkers who have convinced them that they need to do something to get into heaven. Now, you know, Paul was shocked, but if we consider... He was shocked because he knew what they'd been taught. But if we consider the nature of mankind, it really isn't so shocking. When we consider the way Satan works, it's really not so shocking. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Satan distorted the word of God. Has God really said, and then he twisted it a little bit, and what did Eve do in response? She twisted it all the more. It's surprising what a big difference, just a little tweak, a little change can make. You know, sometimes we we hear things and we go, well, that's not too far off. How bad can that be? I was reading yesterday that if you're flying a plane and you start on the equator and and you do a loop around the earth, instead of ending up where you started, if you're off one degree, One degree, one degree out of 360. What's one degree between friends? Come on, 500 miles. So maybe, you know, I mean, obviously we're not on the equator, but let's say you started in Boston and you flew around and you're off one degree, you could wind up what? Washington, D.C., the horror. (laughs) It's just a little difference. It's not that bad. I mean, think about it. What they, were, what they were promoting was good, at least under the old covenant. 
But when it comes to the gospel, adding to the gospel, adding to grace, you don't just wind up at the wrong airport, you wind up someplace you don't want to be. Paul wrote in Romans eleven six 6 that adding to works or adding works to grace causes the grace to lo- no longer be grace. You nullify grace. Grace is, as Sinclair Ferguson likes to say, demerited favor. That is, we get the opposite of what we deserve. Nobody wants what they deserve. Nobody wants that because what we deserve is hell. But when we tamper with the recipe of the gospel of grace, when we add to it, we subtract to it, we negate it. An adulterated gospel, that is a gospel featuring a mixture of grace with some merit, some works, some effort, some deed, is as useless as an idol. You might as well go out to your backyard, you know, do what the ancient people used to do, carve yourself a little idol of stone or maybe a, a really nice piece of wood out there in the back that you decided not to burn for whatever reason. Carve yourself a nice little idol, fall down on the ground and worship it because that's exactly the same effect as when you add works to the gospel. You are believing in a gospel of your own imagining and a God who needs your help to save him. A gospel designed by mortal minds cannot appease the wrath of an immortal, holy God. Such a gospel, such a pseudo-gospel, a false gospel, imagines that there is something good, something worthwhile, something valuable in our efforts. But the prophet Isaiah said that our righteous deeds, in other words, our best efforts, the things that we, at the end of the day, we feel good about, whether it's helping somebody across the street or taking care of a baby or whatever wonderful thing that we've done, feeding the poor, clothing the, those who need clothing, sheltering those who need shelter, whatever good work that we think we have done. Isaiah says it's a filthy garment, a polluted garment. Our best efforts. One who, let's put it another way. If you think, you know what, if I do this, I have a better chance of being saved. You don't understand the gospel. You don't understand grace. You have not believed. There is no chance. It's 100%. Our second truth, a lot of A's here. Ambassadors of angels are anathematized. A lot of A's. We see a distortion of the gospel. Look at verse 7. He says, not that there is another one, another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. You've left for Christ for another gospel. But the bad news is, and this is really bad news, there is no other gospel. And actually, in the wording here, Paul expresses a little bit of sorrow, a little bit of empathy for the Galatians. He feels sorry for them. The literal meaning of trouble you is, it would have the idea of causing something to be shaken together, to be mixed up. Um, I don't, I don't like to mix my protein shakes up by shaking them like that because it doesn't work all that well. But throw it in the blender. That's the idea here. It's taken these ideas and they've, they've just spun them in such a way that it's got these Galatians dizzy. They're theologically dizzy. They're not thinking right. They're confused. The false teachers have succeeded in jumbling their thinking concerning the gospel. See that word there, distort? They really want to distort or change the gospel. They're changing it from one thing to another. It's a metamorphosis. Only in this case, you know, we typically, how do we explain metamorphosis? Uh, The process, we see a caterpillar and it turns into a beautiful butterfly. Well, in this case, the beautiful butterfly turns back into a caterpillar. It's going the wrong way. This is not something that's desirable, but they're pursuing it. We need to defend the gospel, and that's plain right in the next verse. Look at, 
Look at this in verse eight. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Now look at just the first four words. But even if we, it's kind of the royal we. He's talking about we, meaning himself mostly, but the other men that he's with, the other godly men that he's with. And he says, listen, if somehow it were possible for me to show up at your church and start preaching a gospel that's different from what I used to, that's contrary, that's opposed to the gospel I used to preach, I ought to be accursed. I ought to be anathematized. I ought to be condemned. I ought to be sentenced to hell. That's what he's saying. And look, he says, he adds there, but even if we, one of these godly men, or even if me, the apostle of Christ, should appear and do that, that would be bad, and we should be accursed. But look what he says. He says, or an angel from heaven, a messenger from heaven. It's amazing. That angel should be then condemned. It's that serious to misrepresent the gospel. The Master Seminary, we used to have a sign, you know, like if, if you ever watch Notre Dame football, and by the way, my favorite team is whoever's playing Notre Dame, but they have a little sign that they, that's over their locker room as they exit that says, play like a champion today. When I see it, I always go, you know, play like a Catholic today or whatever, you know, I, I just really don't like it. But, at the Master Seminary, they had a little sign, and we didn't get to slap it. I always thought it would be cool, you know, if we could slap it before we went into a preaching lab, you know, preach like a champion or something. That's not what it says anyway. The sign says this. It says, we train men as if lives depend on it. Let me tell you something. Souls do depend on getting the gospel right. An accurate gospel saves a gospel with things added, subtracted, affixed, whatever, whatever's done to the gospel to change it, will not save and in fact condemns. That's why he pronounces that anathema on them. An adulterated gospel, any change, condemns. It's as simple as that. Well, what about a message from heaven? Who would claim to be visited by an angel and receive some revelation that contradicts the Bible? Who would do that? Well, let's see. Muhammad said he was visited by the angel Gabriel, who started giving him parts of the Quran that were contrary to the Bible. And in fact, if you read the Quran, you're going to find that there have been a lot of changes to what is essentially the familiar Old Testament story. See, Joseph Smith, visited allegedly by an angel, founded Mormonism. Ellen G. White received messages from angels, or so she said, the founder of Seventh-day Adventism. The Jehovah Witnesses have their issues with the archangel Michael, whom they believe to be uh, Jesus Christ. I was reading something, they, they, they say that he disintegrated after the cross and then became the archangel Michael. Very strange. But it's as if this verse, even if I or anybody else come and preach a gospel that's different, it's almost like he, it's almost a prophecy because it is a prophecy. This is what's been going on ever since then. Wave after wave after wave of assaults every possible variation and distortion and addition and subtraction. If something could be claimed to be the gospel, no matter how ridiculous the claims, no matter how absurd the source, no matter how unbiblical, attack after attack after attack. But the gospel is not changed. It is not able to be changed. It is no more malleable, that is, subject to change, bending, folding, shaping, whatever, than the nature of God himself, because if you think about it, what is the gospel? It is the outworking of the nature of God. You say, how's that? Well, God is holy. He disapproves of sin, right? That's part of the gospel. Well, God is love. God loves, therefore he acted. He sent his son, second person of the Trinity, to live a perfect life. 
die a sacrificial death, be raised on the third day. God is justice. God will punish every single sin. Every single sin. The only question is whether they are put on Christ at the cross or whether you will pay for them for all eternity. God is righteous. He cannot look at sin. He cannot even abide it. No unclean thing will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There isn't an attribute of God where you could say, well, that has nothing to do with the gospel because it all does. The gospel cannot change. It is fixed. It is his means to save his people. And make no mistake about it. When anyone that you hear teaching says that they found something new or notices something that has been lost, you should approach that with great caution. Your alarm system should be going off like crazy. Why? Because there is nothing new. Jude said it was what? The once for all delivered faith. There's nothing new or improved. It can't get any better. The great Scottish preacher John Brown put it this way. He said it may be called, it is called gospel, but it is misnamed there is no gospel but one, and that ye have abandoned. That's what they had done. Listen, every other gospel, every other so-called gospel is actually an anti-gospel. If the gospel is going north, every so-called pseudo-fake gospel is heading south. They're not close. This isn't about shades of gray. It's not like there are you know, many things from which we can choose from. This isn't a smorgasbord of truth. There is one truth and many enemies of the truth seeking to masquerade the truth or to provide reasonable, seemingly reasonable alternatives. Why? Because Satan is a liar and a deceiver, the father of all lies, and he has many willing emissaries who promote these false gospels to lead billions to eternal damnation. What did Jesus say? In Matthew 7, he said, many are on the broad road. Many think that they're bound for heaven. And if you ask them why they're bound for heaven, they can tell you that it's something that they've done. Oh, they might refer to the grace of God. They might talk about Jesus. But when you get down to it, what are they going to say? In part, it was because of their baptism. It was because of their temple marriage. It was because, because, because they've got something that they contributed to it. That is not the gospel. And by the way, you can't live the gospel. Anybody who says to you, live the gospel, you must live the gospel, doesn't understand the gospel. One person lived the gospel. We believe the gospel. We don't live it. You can't live it. You don't have the capacity to live it. Gospel is good news. That'd be kind of crazy, you know. Are you living the newspaper? Nobody would ever say that. How can you live the gospel? But in Mormonism, that's what they teach. Many teach that. You read that, you, just, you should run the other way. And think about what they were doing here. The Judaizers wanted to add parts of the old covenant, specifically circumcision, to the gospel of grace. Judaism morphed over time from a gospel of grace. We read of the heroes of faith. We understand that they were saved by faith and faith alone. And it really had turned into a ridiculous set of rules. Now look at some so-called Christian denominations out there. Roman Catholicism. They specifically deny salvation by grace alone. They specifically deny and condemn anyone who says that you can know that you're saved. They specifically condemn anyone who teaches that salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. They deny all that. And instead, salvation is only available through the church and by its auspices, meaning there are things that you have to do in order to merit heaven, in order to help Justify yourself. 
every false religion, every false system says to you and appeals to your flesh and says, you know what? The grace of God is abundant and all you have to do is fill in the blank. The truth is you can't even believe apart from the work of God. Salvation is from beginning to end all of God. Now, other gospels, let's look at verse nine. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone's preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. It's interesting that he pronounces a judgment, not on the Galatians, not on the church of Galatia, but on whom? Those who are teaching false things. Is it because he thinks that they're too smart to fall for false teaching? No. It's because he understands the God who has chosen at least some of the people at the church of Galatia. Listen to, as I read Galatians 5, verses 7 to 10. You were running well. You were doing super. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven, or a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. There's a small group of people, maybe it's only one person, with some persuasion, with some influence, who's trying to introduce this heresy into the church. And he goes, get rid of them, basically. That's what that means, verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's not just a little addition to the gospel spoils it, but whoever this person is, you need to get rid of him. He's going to wreck the whole church. Paul is confident, though. Look at that, he says, I have confidence in the Lord, not in you, but in the Lord. Confidence in the Lord, the Lord that is at work in his people. Again, notice he uses accursed. He used that over and over again for emphasis. He wants us to understand that those who teach these things will be delivered over to divine wrath. Paul wants to make plain that, as one man calls it, these self-appointed nobodies who are now making themselves guilty of this crime, they will be punished. They will receive their just deserts. And with all the authority of an apostle of Christ, he is pronouncing God's judgment on those who would distort the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen... Truth number one, abandoning grace is abandoning Christ. Truth number two, ambassadors of angels are anathematized. That just means that these who claim to have messages from angels are condemned. And our third truth, approval of salvation's author is above anthropic assent. Too many A's there. But anyway, here's, here's the point. Salvation's author is Christ. Paul wants the approval of salvation's author more than he wants anthropic assent, which is the approval of man. Fancy way of saying that. And he asks the question, am I going to be a God pleaser or a man pleaser? Look at verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Look, I have to make a choice, he says. I can either just let you guys go and let you believe whatever you want to believe. I can be tolerant. I can go along to get along. But if I do that, I'll basically be resigning my position as a servant of Christ. I'll no longer be faithful to the Lord. Is it wrong to call people on the carpet who are teaching a false gospel? No. It's a service to the Lord. It's what teachers are called to do. They're to exhort in sound doctrine from Titus chapter one, and they're also to refute those who contradict it. Again, Jude, contend for the once for all delivered faith. This is what teachers of the gospel ought to do. Now, if he were seeking the approval of man, what would he do? Well, he'd be out there trying to maybe outmaneuver these false teachers so that he could have a bigger group than they did. 
But Paul makes it clear there is no compromise. There is no midpoint at which the two sides agree. We have gospel and anti-gospel. We have matter and anti-matter. And if they meet, it's going to be a cataclysm. Mankind, us, we, by inclination, we want what? We want rules. We want to know what we have to do. I don't care if it's in your marriage, if it's at work. And you know what? Even in the church sometimes, it appeals to our sin nature. You know what? I don't want to just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you just give me a list of things that I need to get rid of in my life? Is there some way that I, you know, some list of sins that I can just stop committing and then I'll be okay? It's our sin nature that makes us want to raise ourselves up to be worthy of heaven. And this is no small thing. The very glory of the triune God is at stake. He has decreed, planned, and brought about the salvation of his people. He paid for it, all without their help. Is he now to share the credit because of their circumcision or their baptism or their obedience of any kind? Is the sovereign God of the universe in need of our help to save us? The answer is no. He has done everything. Some say, well, God has done all he can and now he just needs you to just kind of lean across the finish line. That's not grace. Any accommodation to sinful man is a rejection of Paul's Lord and Master. He th- would, in effect, be throwing off the yoke. Again, he says, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I can't do both. Finally, look, there's only one source for truth. Look at verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He was taught by the resurrected Lord himself. He didn't learn his gospel in seminary. He didn't read it in a book. He wasn't taught by anyone. And in fact, if we just remember what the Lord said to Ananias, when he gave him the unenviable task of going to take care of Saul, then Saul of Tarsus, in Acts 9, 16, Ananias is not too crazy about the idea, but the Lord says this, For I will show him, Paul, Saul, Paul, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. The Lord himself would show Saul, then Paul, how much he would suffer for the sake of my name. Jesus taught Paul the gospel. And he told him, you're going to suffer. It's not going to be easy. Well, what could sustain a man through beatings, through floggings, running for his life over and over again, shipwrecks, all the things that Paul went through, the whole litany of them? What could sustain him through that except for the very personal relationship and instruction he'd received from the Lord? He didn't need self-help books. He didn't need anything else. He knew what he knew by virtue of hearing it from his creator, his sustainer, his savior. The church at Galatia had been infiltrated by spiritual traitors, those who had joyfully and willingly exchanged the treasure of the gospel for trash. They were leading some astray and causing confusion in the church. And Paul wrote to straighten them out. Now we live, as I mentioned earlier, we live in an age of tolerance. Tolerance is the buzzword. It's the watchword. It's what everyone prizes or what the world prizes above all else. We also live in an age of unprecedented technology. Technology is both a blessing and a curse. I heard John MacArthur recently talking about how via the Internet, some of the resources they're able to send out via the internet, MP3 files of sermons and whatnot, there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Vietnamese holding Bible studies in rice paddies. Now that is a country that is communist, officially atheist, that condemns 
Christianity in every way possible. But because of technology, the Lord is using that now to reach people that have never heard the gospel, would have no way of knowing the gospel. But technology, as I said, is a double-edged sword. What's the face of Christianity across the globe? It's the so-called Trinity Broadcasting Network. Countless millions led into false systems of salvation, whether it be the prosperity gospel, which says, you know, God loves you and wants you to be rich. God loves you and will bless you if you just send all your money. God loves you, but he is not a trinity. God loves you, but I, they, have a, they have a million different variations. Not a million, but a lot of different variations. But they all have one problem. They don't preach the gospel. What is the gospel? What is it that we are to defend? Well, I said earlier, it is simply put, it is this, that we are helpless to save ourselves, that nothing we do can merit God's favor. And in fact, our very best efforts are so riddled with sin that if we were to hold them up before God, he would send us straight to hell. Those are our best efforts. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, Paul wrote to the Romans. Because of that, and because God cannot abide sin, cannot see, look upon sin with favor, cannot have it in his presence, that sin had to be dealt with. God dealt with it. We couldn't. Having sinned, there's no way we could make up for it. There's no amount of effort, no amount of work, no amount of sacrifice that we could possibly ever do that could make up for our sin. So God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, eternally God, to take on an additional nature as man, to suffer the restrictions, the limitations that we do, to feel the effects of gravity, to be hungry, to be sad, to be tempted. And yet in all these things, not only did he never sin, and the way we think about sin, which is never to do anything wrong, but he also never did anything that was less than perfect, which we often fall short of. Have you ever loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength for one hour? Have you ever loved your neighbor like yourself for a minute? The answer to both of those is no. Jesus never sinned lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross, not as a victim, but as a willing participant in the redemption of his people. He willingly took the burden of our sin upon him. And God the Father poured out his wrath on the Son on the cross. And then we know he was satisfied with it, both because the scripture tells us and because he raised him from the dead. All that is the gospel. Anything else at best is a response. Now I tell you to believe in the gospel. Is that part of the gospel? No. Believing is something that you will do if God causes you to be born again. You will believe. You will inevitably believe. And I beg you and urge you and plead with you to believe even today. I want you to be reconciled to God. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified because we want people to believe. We want them to see their sin, to see the cross, and to flee their sin and to embrace the Savior. But you can't do anything to add to that. You can't do anything to be better than the gospel. There's nothing better. The gospel is good news. Good news is God has done it all. In Christ, he has accomplished your salvation. Our response needs to be to believe. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, this morning, this afternoon, 
Would you so fix these truths in our mind that no smooth talker, no flatterer, no one who wants to appeal to our flesh can convince us that any addition or any subtraction or any new thought, any way needs to be added to the gospel. The gospel is perfect. Would you cause us to rest in that? Would you cause us to trust entirely in the finished work of Christ Jesus? That is not to say that you won't change us once you save us. But let us not confuse changing ourselves with the work that you will do. There is no preparation of salvation. It is all a work of yours. Your spirit causes us to be born again. You draw us, you convict us. Even today, Lord, would you be pleased to draw, to convict, to save, to grant faith to any here who don't have it. May you guard this church and everyone here from false teachers, from false teaching, from any so-called gospel whose end is only condemnation, we pray. In Christ's name and for his sake, amen. Thank you for watching the ministry of the Word of Bethlehem Bible Church. Our desire really is simple. We want to preach Christ Jesus as Lord. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we think the best way to do it is verse by verse, systematically preaching through books of the Bible. If you're here in central Massachusetts, 8.30 service and then an 11 o'clock service with a 6 p.m. service as well, going through a different book of the Bible. If you have a question, you can go to www.bbcchurch.org. That's our website, noco90, nocompromiseradio.com. Or if you'd like to write me, info at nocompromiseradio.com. And we'll be glad to respond to you with any question. What about salvation? How do I have my sins forgiven? What is church discipline? Do you believe in the gifts for today? Any question we want to help you and serve you as we point you to the scriptures where Jesus Christ is proclaimed as Lord. God bless you.